Hi, and welcome to this first and introductory part to the tutorial One Perception to Rule the Mole of ACM ICMR 2020. My name is Chebe Giro, and I will just provide an overview about how we can encode uh, audio vision language all together with uh, deep learning. First, I'll start sharing the screen. Got it. So this tutorial is called One Perception to Rule the Mole, and this all in this uh, talk, it refers to vision, text, speech, and audio. You see that the tutorial is organized in different parts in which you combine vision with text or with speech or with audio or sound. During the last years, we have seen that now we have a tool that rules them all, all these communities. So this tool is not a ring, but actually it's the perceptron. So all these communities that used to kind of have separate paths and techniques somehow, uh, thanks to deep learning, they, there has been a total convergence of uh, disciplines. Everything started with this uh, first task, in was, which was image classification. So probably you all know about AlexNet, which was this tool that thanks to to do convolutions, managed to um, beat the state of the art computer vision for image classification. And I would like you to think about it as a way of encoding uh, images into binary representations on one hot representations. And I think that if we look at it in this way, we can totally understand like uh, how the, the, the vision community has evolved and has integrated together with language or, or audio communities. We can consider that this output, this uh, this one hot encoding at the output, it's a projection in a n-dimensional space with as many dimensions as classes in which we want to classify our data. So in this case, we have like uh, a three-dimensional space because that's easy to represent. And all the images that depicted cat should be mapped, should be represented around this point, all the ones uh, encoding dogs should be represented around this point and hoax around this point. And that's what, uh, doing that, managing to learn representations in the sense of representation, in this case of one whole representation, uh, it's equivalent to solving, uh, in this case, an image classification task. So now let's think about ImageNet or AlexNet actually, architecture as an encoding task in which from the image we'll learn a one whole representation. This venue has also been explored by in other fields like language, speech, sound, music. And also the opposite way. There are also tools that given a representation, which can be as well a one hot representation or a non one hot representation, some learning embedding, it, they are able to generate uh, multimedia data. For example, images. There was this work called DCGAN that maybe was one of the first words that addressed this task of generating images in a conditioned way. In this case, they were conditioned by the class of, of CAD. So what we have now are encoders, neural encoders and neural decoders. And uh, they are all, they can all be learned end to end. And we consider that what we learn in between are representations. This is why uh, in many of these words, they refer to representation learning. So in this tutorial, I will always keep uh, following this scheme and just playing with the inputs and outputs or maybe making variations of these schemes. So let's start first with uh, uh, the encoders that we'll need to uh, process all the multimedia data that we'll focus on this tutorial. For example, images. That's probably the most famous one. At least I have a computer vision background, so at least for me. And as I was mentioning, AlexNet was this uh, work that kind of uh, adopted proposals, uh, architectural proposals that, that have been out for quite a long time, uh, convolutional neural networks, but they managed to, to run it on the large scale data set of ImageNet. But this is, there are like 2D convolutions, uh, max pooling layers, and um, some, of course, um, 
nonlinearities, and at the end, some Fourier quantity layers that at the very end, you had not a three-dimensional uh, representation as a one hot as in the example that I presented, but a 1,000 representation, but that's it. And then you would like for each dimension of the representation that co would correspond to one of the classes you want to predict. Similarly, you, there were, have been uh, words that have took a step further and say, okay, we can also process videos kind of following this approach. And if we consider each video as a CNN, as a, as a sorry, each video as a sequence of images, you can, we could encode like each of the frames with a commercial neural networks, the same thing as for, for uh, the image frames, and then combine them somehow. One way, one way for combine them, we like with the recurrent neural network nowadays, uh, people are also trying to do that with uh, attention-based mechanisms like transformer-like architectures. What about the decoding? What if we want to decode uh, images from a, a kind of a low-dimensional representation? So there has also been uh, works there that basically they have introduced the, what's so-called the convolution layer. So basically it's like a, a convolution and an upsampling. And, there have, and it's possible to go from low-scale low representation, like in this case, that would be like uh, 100 presentations, a uh, vector of one, 100 dimensions, uh, to go kind of upscaling, upscaling, until generating uh, three channels and large uh, spatial definition image. So now, if we have both encoders and decoders, you can build uh, applications that go, for example, from images in RGB into uh, segments. So that's, that would be like the task of uh, object instance segmentation. Or you can just translate images from sketches to RGB images with this whole uh, popular architecture of UNET. What about checks? Okay, maybe I will spend a bit more time with text because at least for me as a computer, with my computer vision uh, background, it was not that obvious how to how to uh, play with these discrete inputs in a neural network. So, but there are ways, of course, to uh, learn representation from text. So let's took a, a sentence, actually, uh, 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 like a second, then this is a sequence of words. And here the problem is like, okay, what if I will have my um, uh, Irish dictionary, like as we are in ICMR doubling, what if I have my, uh, how can I, my Irish dictionary, how can I fit that? into an internet, where, where, where do I put the word here, okay? Maybe it's easier with with images, right? Because one pixel, okay, you have it in one input neuron, but what, what, how do I put the word into this network? So one way could be like assigning codes to letters, but then um, this would uh, introduce some unnatural ordering that we don't want. And then the solution there would be like to use again one hot encodings, one for not for each one for each letter. Well, one for each letter, that's possible. That's something that something you can do it, but most people they don't do that. What they do is they have a dictionary, just just count how many words they want to play with, and they assign a unique code in a 100 presentation for each image. Okay, and that's that's a beginning. Okay, but at least now we already have a vector we can fit into a neural network. It's quite large, or it can be quite large because of there can be like thousands of words in a in a language. So what normally what people are doing is they uh, they learn they learn some representations and they and most of most of the language applications they start with these learned representations. These learned representations actually they have uh, they have shown that can, they can have they can capture some semantics and if you project them in a in a 2D representations uh, you can observe that they, they acquire some semantic meanings. Like for example you have representations that are related to cities which are nearby in these uh, 2D projections, uh, in this case, using TSME. And you can, you can also observe like some patterns that kind of seem to indicate that there's some uh, interesting semantics captures in the representations, okay? Now I'll explain how you obtain the representations. We would like to have the representations to be uh, low dimensionally, low dimensional, uh, because typically we enter, we start with a uh, thousand, or a few thousand dimensions input, I would like to have like something much more, much more compact as a, uh, a representation. So typically this is done with uh, what's called language model task, uh, which would be, for example, given a sequence of words, like the cat sits on the whatever, predict the next word. And that this is a kind of chart that it's, uh, that we can train with large amounts of, let's say, a label data. We can go 
get Wikipedia, download it all, and then just train uh, a neural network to, to predict the next word in whatever sequence amount of words. And that this way, um, the, the weights of, of the network that we learn, that we kind of, uh, at least with by the context where the, the words appear, it can be like some rich uh, representations for each of the word or for each of the sentences. And, and here, of course, I'm being super, super simple. I'm just trying to explain how to fit uh, words into images. And if you are trying to do something like this, uh, if you're trying to use language, what you will find, you will find pre-trained embeddings, and that's where you will start your your whatever multimodal task. And what could you do? If you have a sequence of words and you, you will encode them, so this will be chime, and then this will be like the representation of economic, this will be a one hot, then when we project to something of smaller dimension, this will be this representation. And for example, you can you could encode uh, a sequence of words with a state of a recurrent neural network. That was the one of the first approaches that were exploited for machine translation. And then say, okay, so this set, this this uh, sentence, this sequence of words that you have here, I encode it as the final state of a recurrent neural network. In this case, that would be this final state. So this this state here would represent this sequence of words, and that was that was used. Uh, at some point for machine translation. Can we encode uh, language with convolutions? The answer is yes. And that's maybe that's one of the misunderstandings at least my students sometimes have because they have they see convolutions in the computer vision uh, courses. They see other uh, techniques like RNNs or, or transformers in language. And then they, they it's hard to, to see how, how they both of them fit. So the answer is yes, you can totally use convolutions with, with text. You can think about that now, imagine that we have a sequence of eight words and we can, uh, each of the words, I somehow, uh, pre I use some pre-trained representations of learning with the language model, model and then each of these words are represented with a 100 dimensional vector. Then if I just put flatten this in a 2D matrix, you can think that my input sequence, it's this 2D matrix. And now things get a bit easier, right? Because if it's a 2D matrix, <coughs> that's quite similar to an image now. It's kind of 2D. And then uh, we can think that uh, maybe we can build a 1D convolution. But when I say 1D, it means that it's 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 1D because the, the input, it's, let's say it's 1D, it's a sequence of, of words, okay? But actually the, the filter by itself, it's it's not 1D because it will be, it will have like some uh, width of the filter and it will also match the depth of the representation. The same, that's the same thing with images where uh, at least my students, they, they struggle into understanding that the convolutional filters, typically we only draw the 2D part of the convolutional filter, but there's, a, there's also a depth that it's matching the amount of channels. So that's the same thing here. Okay, now we have a sequence of depth of length eight, but they have depth 100. So actually the 1D convolutional filter, actually it's a 2D matrix. In this, in this case, this dimension of three, that's something that we we define that's a, a like the size of, of the of the kernel that we in this case we, we, we made learn. So what happens now? If I if I instead of if I just remove this 3D version or vision of the of the situation and I just look at it from, from this side. So I I so all these vectors that you see here, the, the I just I would just look at all, all see the, the front part, but there's a the whole vector behind. That's what you sorry, that's what you see here. Okay. That would be like the input sequence. Now I have this free uh, dimensional convolutional filter. Actually, it's 1D, remember, okay? Just for representation pole process, I don't just throw everything all the time. So that's it. Now I have my convolutional filter, I have my uh, sequence. I can compute the, the products of matrices and, and provide the results uh, as an output sequence. In this case, if I don't do anything else, the input sequence will be eight. The output would be sick because of the of the borders because they, the convolutional filter cannot go beyond it. But of course, there are three tricks to solve that. You can do zero padding so that the, the same thing as images so that the dimensions actually match. And actually, you can make it totally causal uh, because sometimes what you want is our uh, filter which are causal. So I can put my zeros here. And my filter, the output always depends from the present and previous. Uh, samples, that's the definition of, of causality. Okay, so we can encode 
uh, text with commercial networks. And for example, that's one of the works that, that use it uh, um, for their, their language task. We can encode it, we can also decode it. So for example, uh, if we have a area explained that we could encode one sentence in the state of an RNN, and then this state could be decoded into a sequence of words, for example, if you're doing translation. And that allows like to solve tasks like neural machine translation, as I was mentioning, from text to text. What about speech or audio or sound or music? Because in the end, they are, they are treated quite often quite similarly. Again, you will find in the literature uh, works that are using uh, recurrent neural networks to encode them, like this uh, listen, attend, and spell uh, work. Uh, you will find words that they use convolution neural networks to encode speech, like this was uh, developed at UPC by Santi Pascual, this speech encoder uh, fully, convolution, fully convolution, convolutional. And for decoding, same thing. You will have like um, speech synthesis, speech generation that is based on RNNs, on, on RNNs again, uh, on CNNs, also uh, with transformers, but so all all uh, all, the, all the architectures could be applied into the sequence of of samples, which is uh, speech or sound. Also with transpose convolutions in this case. So the the same tools that you maybe again my background is from computer vision. Maybe I'm too biased over that, but all these tools that we have seen in computer vision, they are being used by the speech community, for example. And I guess this happens like. Uh, if you are in the language or speech or music communities, you will also see like that the same tools, same architectures, they are being deployed there. Here are examples of audio decoding with RNNs or with CNNs, which uh, there's a, this super famous work of WaveNet. So if we can encode and decode uh, our sound and speech with uh, neural networks, then we can build many exciting applications. For example, oh yeah, so I forgot. Uh, in many, it's true that in the case of speech and sound, in many cases, um, many researchers, they exploit uh, what it's kind of known or accepted by the community, which is like frequencies are important and there are like some way to extract them or handcraft it, let's say, and which of course they, they make the things much easier to the network. Uh, things like the Mellow Spectrum, Spectrums, Coquelograms, and FCC, there are quite a, a few there. And many many researchers are using that, okay, and that can, can, can facilitate uh, training. Of course, at the extreme, you've had huge, uh, infinite amount of computation, infinite amount of data. You could, you can, you could also try to do things draw, but in, in many applications, you just already accept that these uh, features that we extract are, are good. Uh, they are useful, that we will not be missing anything by doing that transformation, and that, that helps the networks into learning. Okay, so applications that go from speech to speech, for example, speech, speech enhancement. And again, this word that was developed at UPC at our university, which uh, was the first word uh, using uh, genetic fiber cell networks for denoising uh, speech. Mm. Then we can start doing combination, which is very exciting. For example, when we go from speech to uh, checks, then we'll have an automatic speech recognition. Or what it, we do the opposite way. We have text and the output to speech, then we'll have like speech synthesis. So orchid, this tutorial will be structured like in this way, like putting the steps uh, input, output, and changing the orders and doing combinations, and always under the umbrella of our good friend, the perceptron. So I hope you will follow the rest of the tutorial. Uh, I will first acknowledge my, my team of, of wonderful students who kind of help and have helped me in preparing this and we, with who we are exploring all these exciting venues. So hope you enjoyed the rest of the tutorial and see you during the live sessions.